Now here's 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 a funny one. No. I call this one. Yeah, you guys ever hear of a roof mutual? No. A roof mutual. Nope. Okay. New guy in a company, Al Jacobs. His old man was in 120 truck. The kid was phenomenal. He was a big, big kid, about 250 pounds, about six foot. All right, that has something to do with the story. So the day tour was over. He was working a day tour. I'm working a night tour. So we used to hang around in the, in the, in the grotto in the back of the firehouse afterwards, you know, socializing. So we get a box, top floor job in a tenement. I had the OV. I go up. I'm cutting. I got my, my flat axe, my saw. Uh, I think Nelson Ross was the roof man. He's doing his things. Here comes Al Jacobs. He rode with, he rode with us, and he wanted to come up and give us a hand, right? He's got a six-foot hook, and he's got on flip-flops. It gets better. It gets better. He, uh, he's got flip-flops on. He's got shorts on and a T-shirt. Oh so earlier God. in the night, uh, Chief Kennedy comes over, 16th Battalion. He, you know, Tom Kennedy, great, great fireman, 31 truck guy. He came over to visit us, and he's seen Al, and he's he seen me, and we're talking, blah, blah, blah. So now he, uh, we're up on the roof, right? So we're cutting this hole, and we're pulling the roofing material. Al pulls hot, bubbling, tar roofing material onto his foot. <laughs> but his foot flop. Okay, but his now, foot flop on. Yeah, now what, now what do we do? Okay, so now we're on a roof. <laughs> this kid's got a, thir- he's got a third degree burn oh on his leg and his God. ankle. So we take off our clothes. Okay, now I'm 158 pounds. He puts my pants on that he can't get buttoned. <laughs> he puts my T-shirt on. Oh, you're going to make him shirt. work. He's going to work. I got you. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Okay, yeah, now yeah. I put on his size 44 shorts and I'm holding them in the middle. <laughs> And his flip-flops, which look like snowshoes, and we come down, oh, the, boss, the boss says, Chief, uh, Al Jacobs is, is going sick. And he looks and he, like, wait a minute. And he just goes like this. You and that was it. <laughs> <laughs> that was our oh, mutual. Ah, <laughs> oh, now it makes sense. I you made a mutual on the roof, bro. Yeah. Dude, why flip flops? That's frowned upon. It's no good. You can't do yeah, that. Well, unless, unless they're Nomex. <laughs> <laughs> Nomex flip flops. Scoop. Write that down. Nomex flip flops. Get Getting salty. Nomex flip flops. Coming soon. <laughs> and uh, I guess I had two or three months in the truck. Uh, I was the can man. And uh, it was a night tour. We pull out a couple hours into the tour. And um, as we're pulling out, the dispatchers are telling us they're getting a few phone calls. We're first due. The fire's on Vanderbilt Avenue. Uh, I don't remember the cross street, but it might have been like Bergen or something. And uh, as we're going down the block, the smoke showing. Uh, the officer, uh, lieutenant, um, who was a salty uh, lieutenant, had spent his uh, career as a fireman on the Lower East Side, then got promoted, came to 132. He gave the 1075. So uh, we're first though, got uh, smoke showing from the top floor, four story uh, old law tenement. So I got the can, me, the you officer. Back the window, Hank? What's that? Oh, uh, yeah, that was typical. You know, boom, the, the, uh, the show for the officer would, you know, reach around and bang on the window because if we were riding backwards, obviously we couldn't see. So as he's giving the 1075, right? they're, bang, they're banging on the window. So you, we kind of knew we were going to work anyway. So, um, you know, off we go. It's top floor of a four story old law tenement. Uh, get up to the fire floor, force the door to the fire apartment, which was kind of flimsy. And, uh, you know, heavy smoke pushes out and some heat. Don't don't see the fire yet. So go crawling in and uh, find Hold the on, bedroom. Second. The engine up there yet with a charged lawn? You guys ahead of them? No, we were ahead. We were, we were first new truck. A- A8280 was first new engine, and they were in the process of stretching. Um, you guys so, are going in there. A lot of people don't know. Correct. Don't so, yes. <clears throat> Yeah, listen, that's the way I was taught to fight fires. I mean, obviously, you know, I don't know if you guys are following. And I'm sure some of the people that are following, and, and, and this could be a, a debate about that captain in Atlanta. That's just, he's in the process of getting suspended because he went in on his own and pulled out like a 90-something-year-old woman. Um, uh, but because the rest of his team 
I guess he was ahead of them. They're making a big deal at the uh, yeah, like, protocol. So, what's that? What are they getting them on the two in, two out thing? Yeah, I, whatever, whatever. There, uh, listen, it's all over the firewire and, and the Twitter stuff. So, I mean, there's people supporting them. I support the guy. There's no way the guy should be getting suspended for for doing his job. I mean, the, 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 if you, I saw videos of the of the building that he went into and that he came out of with the woman, and and, and uh, you know, it, it it wasn't a joke. This wasn't like maybe it could have been a grab. This guy made a really nice grab. Uh, I believe the woman ended up dying a few hours later from her burns, but that just tells you how bad it was. Um, right. And like I said, they're they're in the process of suspending this this captain rather than applauding him. But uh, rather than giving him a medal for making that, the grab. Listen, if, the, if that's the new fire service, I'm glad I was in the old fire service. You know, that's all I can say. So going back to the story. Um, so we, you know, we get we get in, find the bedroom. There's fire blowing out the door, but you know it's running the ceiling. Going, I hit it with the can a little bit. We make the search. Uh, the engine's coming up. So uh, I reach up on the bed. Boom! I feel a body, and I'm like, now I'm 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 a new you know fairly new in the truck. I got maybe you know 15 months on the job, and I'm like, holy shit! I got so I'm like, I get the man. Lou, I got somebody here. You know, so he said, right, get him out in the hallway. So I, I reach up, I grab this body, boom, hits the floor, and I'm dragging dragging the body out to the public hall. Hey, now, when, back in those times, K-Man didn't have a radio, did he? Um, I'm trying to remember. In the At that point, no. It was the, the inside, the, the officer had the radio. The can and the irons did not have the radio. Although we were in the process, they, the job was in the process of giving them. I don't remember at that point i had a radio i know the ov and the roof always had it to show for any officer right and even in 79 when i got on the in, even in the engine the um the nozzle and the backup had the new the new 4.5 scots the doorman and the control man you had to take you had to go to the open a compartment you had the suitcase with the old scots with the bell on it and stuff so half the time the guys didn't even put it on because it was a pain in the neck so but they were coming, you know, that was the point the transitions were happening. The, the new masks were coming in for everybody. The radios were starting to come in for everybody. But, um, I mean, the lieutenant was right in the room. I just lifted my mask off, you know, hey, whoa, I got somebody. So I drag it out in the hallway. And now, now you know, your, your adrenaline's pumping. The things are going through your head. I got a body. I'm new in the truck. I'm like, oh, oh my God, I'm, you know, I, I got somebody here. And now you're, now you're like, wow, I'm, I'm a lot of guys are going to accept me, you know, everything. Get out to the and hallway. Where, where it's not really smoking. <laughs> is Chief Steve okay with this? Is you got it? Is he right? Uh, it's got all two right. down already. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you want all the <laughs> so, <laughs> so here's the best part of the story. Yeah, there, huh? So I, I get out into the hallway. Engines, obviously, they got the line now. They're working. The second new truck is up, you know, coming up. And uh, so as I, I take my mask off, because I'm going to see if I got to do CPR or whatever's going to happen. And as I take my mask off, I got a naked woman with about a 12-inch butcher knife sticking out of her chest. Holy nice <laughs> girl. And I'm like, I'm just Make looking it. down. I can't even talk. I'm trying to yell to the lieutenant. I'm like, ah, da, 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 da. You know, I, was like, I was so <laughs> nervous. And now I got this woman with a butcher knife sticking out of her chest. You know, with a few burns. But so obviously this was a, a murder. And, and the brain surgeon figured, I light, I light the room on fire. You know, there'll be no evidence. You know, like the knife's going to burn up in a chest. So needless to say, that, he went, from, that went from a grab to a big, uh, you know, the marshals responded, <laughs> 45 one the precinct detectives responded. I'm getting interviewed, you know, because by the detectives. And that was that was my first big non-grab, you know, with a couple of months <laughs> in the truck. Listen, you it was all uphill from there, baby. Exactly. <laughs> Win it, you still made the search, you still went in ahead of the line, and you made a grab. You didn't know she was having a, a, a butcher knife sticking out of her chest. <laughs> no, granted, but it just, I mean, that was a, a little twist at the end that I didn't expect. You know, as a you know, young guy, and uh, you know, you're all, like I say, you're all hop, hyped up and thinking, right. wow, you know, I'm gonna maybe I'm gonna make a difference here. You know, the only difference I met, made was, I guess, maybe made it easier for the marshals and the detectives later on. That was about it. I want to show, yeah. show the uh, 
the chat and everybody watching this pick as well. And uh, this one's a little, it's a little, a little rough here. But what was going? What was happening here? Tell us about this pick. So I had transferred to ladder thirty-one, and um, because I was studying, I had to show for seat ladder five, and I was studying for the lieutenant's exam, and I was hitting it hard. I was, I was, you know, I was pretty ready. I was going to fire tech, going to fire command. I devoted two two whole years to just studying, studying, and I was into it. So, so I said to myself, you know, what I wanted to do was to sharpen my tools again. I want to get back into the grit, get into the smoke. You know, uh, I gave up the seat, and I said to myself, I said, you know what, it would be nice. Where would I want to go? I says, why don't I go back where it all started for me in 1972? That's pretty go cool. Back to ladder 31. I says, if I got promoted as a lieutenant. It'd be nice to go there, but I says, you know, what's the odds of that happening? I said, but I could go there as a fireman on the next order that I was coming out within days. So, boom, I throw a ladder 31. I said, and I go. I, I, I leave ladder five, and that's just, this is August, uh, July of 2001, just before the trade center. So, I don't know. Mm. I'm up at ladder 31, and I'm there for a couple months, but my big, my second milestone after driving Uncle Jack in ladder 38. My second milestone is now I'm driving ladder 31. I did the whole full circle. I went from, yeah, really? I went through and I, and then one of my, uh, I'm 42 trucks in the firehouse because they're renovating. It's just like the old days, 42 is in there, 82. The oh, house yeah. is pretty yeah. high activity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. And, and so, um, so I'm up there for um, <clears throat> um, a couple months and they come out and they say, look, we need a detail. They have to go down to the first division. I have 19 years on a job. And they said, you know, you don't have to go down. You don't have to take the detail. Because uh, I went in with another guy on the same order. And they said, you know, it's really the other guy's um, uh, detail if he, you know, if you don't want it. He said, but the guy's coming up like from you, up there in Orange County. I said, I live down in Barry Park. I'll take the detail down there. I can walk. I said, send me the ladder 10. I'll, I'll work in 10 house. I said, I can walk there. And if at night, the place kind of, you know, Manhattan shuts down lower downtown. I said, I can really get some studying in. The test is two months away. I says, you know, I'll take the detail. So I get detailed down to ladder 10 on the 8th. I drive uh, September 8th. Right. Well, wait, wait, for guys, you guys who don't know in the chat, I'll probably everybody does, but ladder 10 is right outside the trade center. In the sh shadows, the shadows, the shadows of the trade center. Ten, ten to ten, ten engine, ten trucks, right there. Is that like on like Liberty Street or something? On it's, on, it's on Liberty, correct. I remember that one. Yep. So I go down there and I see the captain. He's okay. Uh, I want you to have to go drive fifteen truck there. So I drive fifteen truck over by Wall Street. Next day, I'm driving ladder ten. I said, and uh, I get an overtime spot, and that's the ninth, September 9th. and I'm watching the Band of Brothers. Mm -hmm. uh, that just came out, you know. So I'm watching it, and, and, and the captain comes in. And he says, "Okay, uh, so this is my second day tour, and then I would be back, you know, um, the ninth, the tenth, tenth and eleventh night tours." He goes, "I'm going to group give you group change." I said, "Okay." He says, "Come back Thursday." I said, "All right." Wow. So I'm off the eleventh. Wow. And um, so that day, um, I'm over fire tech over in um, Staten Island, and I'm sitting next to Harvey Harrell from uh, Rescue 5, and a guy comes busting through the doors. And we're all taking tests, you know, fire tests, you know, you, you, mm -hmm. you answer questions. And a guy blows the doors open, and he says, uh, planes just hit, two planes just hit the World Trade Center, two planes just hit, you know. So uh, I said, holy shit, I says, you know, my wife's on the 81st floor over there. So I run out, and I could see the, the smoke. So I run to my, my car, and I jump in and I start racing over the Verrazano on it. And it's like that, that game leapfrog with Froggy, Froggy. Frog, I'm going around yeah. the cars, you know? Yeah. And I'm yeah. whipping around cars, going around. And I'm trying to look, trying to see, but I, the South Tower is blocking the view of the North Tower. I get into the BQ, BQE, Brooklyn Queens Expressway, and there's a bus lane in it with the, the Jersey barriers. And there's a cop waving, you know, like I can't come in. And I hold my badge out the window and I, I'm flying. I go right into the, the bus lanes. And now I got five police cars right on my tail. We're all riding this together. And I get through the tunnel. The tunnel's still open at the time. But as I'm driving, I'm looking up. I'm 
I'm looking at it halfway up. I says, all right, that's halfway. She's going to be a little bit further north of that, you know, for, up, up, further up from that. And so, um, so, uh, so I get into Manhattan and um, I park my car clear of West Street. West Street's all blocked. And I start running up West Street to get my gear in the back of Lattertown's firehouse. And with that, I start running this. Well, it's a mess. The whole street, they're covering the yellow yellow bags are covering people. There's small torsos and things like that, all in, splat in the street. And I cut down um, Albany Street from West Street over to Liberty. And it looks like a meat truck exploded overhead. And I'm watching when I'm trying to run. I finally get inside the firehouse. And I said, you know, let me I just, I just want to put a shirt on. And I put on my bunker gear because it's there. And the guy across from me is Pete Beerfield from 42 Truck. All the rigs are gone. Or they're outside right now. And Pete, uh, Pete's got a nice, beautiful cigar. He's got his baseball hat on, as I knew from 42 driving him up there. And uh, I said, as soon as you're ready, Pete, we'll go. We'll go together. We'll go like a team. He goes, yeah, okay. So uh, as we both head out the door, the captain of uh, 10 truck says, he goes, Dan, he says, stop. He says, take a Halligan. Make sure you have And I, you know, I said, yeah, give me a Halligan. He had a Halligan in the back locker. Pete keeps running. I grab the Halligan. And as I start to catch, run up to him. A uh, guy clotheslined me right across my neck. He goes, here it comes, here it comes. And I took a quick look up, and I could see the top of the South Tower start to twist. And with that, started to come down. I drop everything, and there's an Asian man laying in front of quarters with a broken leg. <clears throat> Collar him, start pulling him back. As far as, and we get blasted. We get knocked down. Boom. COVID, blown over. Well, every window in the firehouse is blown out. Holy the, shit. The steel doors... Full of pole holes or crushed inward rocks all inside there. So, with the noise, and you've heard it before, it sounds like a freight train coming over your head. Um, it, it sounds just like that. It just, it's just you, you, but the thing is, it stops immediately. The noise stops. And from that, you know, and then you're trying to get your bearings, but it's all black. It's like you're swallowing a black wool sock, right? And, uh, and the Asian man is going, I said, we're going out. And I grab him and I pull him back to the rest of the firehouse out on the back door. I forget the name of the street back there. But I pull him out there and nobody's around. Nobody's around. All of a sudden, I see two paramedics walking by. I says, I says take this guy. He's got to go. He's got a broken leg. So with that, I'm like, okay. Now we're looking. I can see somewhat as it starts to clear the debris of the South Tower. And to me, like my brain is, is starting to frizz down. I'm like, oh, Jesus. I said, I got to get over to my wife because, you know, I'm even at this point, she's up on a roof. You know, I always tell her, you got to come down, take the, uh, take the stairs. But at this point, I'm, I'm looking at, to me, it looks like the plane hit below her. I said, she's got to be up on the roof. And so with that. She's in the North Tower now? She's in the North Tower. Okay. So the South, the, Tower, the South Tower got hit second, but it fell first. Fell yeah. first, right. So that's down now. So the only thing left of now is, is the North Tower. And so now I'm trying to get over to her like that. And um, this guy, uh, out of the blue, out of the gray smoke, is Mel Hazel, the fireman I know from out of 31. Oh, holy shit. And out of everybody. We have that picture, Pete, with that, at dinner. He yep. comes out like a, looking like a ghost, you know, like a ghost comes to you, you know. And he sees, like, at the 31 of my helmet. He goes, 31? He goes, you okay? I go, Mel, it's me, Dan. Go, Holy gee. And we hug, you know, we do it like that. That saves us because with that, a cop comes running around the corner. That's Mel Hazel right there. Beautiful wife, Wendy. Um, so a cop comes running around the corner, and he's not stopping. He's yelling, North Tower is coming down any second. Just got a report from the helicopter. He's telling that to us as he's running. And we both turn, and next thing you know, here it comes. The, the rumble starts coming. In. But we're in the black zone. There's no, we can't run. We can't outrun this. And I grabbed Mel, I said, we can lay right up against the Deutsche Bank. What we did, we kind of did a fetal position right up against the Deutsche Bank. Whoa. And we get blasted. We get we get knocked down. We get blasted. And, and again, when it all comes down and it blows, you know, off through us, we get nailed with pieces of a rock and whatever <sighs> like that. And we're waiting for the big hit. You know, like everybody says, you just wait. And then again, boom. It's so quiet. so quiet. It's so quiet. But uh, you can't breathe again. And when you swallow... You have to actually swallow to breathe because the, the blackness is just filling up your mouth like a sock. 
And I said, let's, and Mel's like, let's get out of here. We can't breathe. And we crawl, we crawl into, uh, I think it's Greenwich, it's Greenwich um, Avenue, I believe it, but it's Greenwich. And uh, we crawl like that. And I scratched the street. And I said, you can see all blacktop because everything is gray. I said, Mel, we're in the street, we're in the street, you know. And I'm trying to turn my flashlight on. We're like, uh, I'm trying to turn my diehard flashlight on. And we crawl a little bit further, and there's three cars roaring in fire. They're, they're, they're roaring. And uh, we couldn't even see them. So, Jeez. cut ahead. Um, Mel says, you know, we, we can't believe what's going on. I said, my wife was on the roof. I said, I don't know what I'm going to do. So he's a, he's, a, he's a fire marshal, Mel. He said, right. he said I'm going to try to fire the command post. I said, I have to go home. I have to go try and find my wife. I don't even know where to begin. There's 19 acres of debris where I'm going to start looking for. I said, but I have to go home. I have, to, I have to think something out. So I walked the two blocks home, and I woke up, and, and I know all the doormen. I, I'm the only fireman in the building. Everybody in this building is bankers and lawyers and, you know, uh, stock market guys and things like that. I'm the only blue-collar fireman in the place. So I hang out with the doormen sometimes. When my wife's work, I go down and, you know, I, I chit-chat with them, hang out. They don't recognize me. They go, fireman, do we have to get out of here? I said, I said no, no, no. I says, it's me. It's me, Dan. I says. Did, did you see, Gee, did you see my wife come home? They go, oh, no, no. I'm like, oh, oh my God. So, so I go up, we're on the ninth floor, and our apartment used to look out to the South Tower. I could see the half of the, the South Tower from my apartment, and I had the windows all open that day, you know. And so I walk up to my apartment, and I, and I knock on the door, and, you know, there's no answer, right? My keys are back in the forest. So I can't get in. So I, I have a little meltdown right there. And so I said, I come back down the stairs, and I sit on this bench, and I sit on the bench, and I'm praying. I'm like, just give me guidance, God. You know, where, where do you want me to be? What should I do? What should be my next step? What do you want me to do? And <clears throat> goes in my head, goes, um, go back to your apartment. Open up your apartment. That's clear the message I get. I said, okay. So I go up, I grab the super that I know. I says, I need a hammer and a chisel. And we walk upstairs. <laughs> I do the farming thing, and boom, 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 steel buck door, boom, 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 boom. And I finally forced the door open, and the phone is ringing. I still had phone service. I pick up the phone, and it's, and it's Jean's aunt. And she's uh. like, she says, where's, is Jean, is Jean okay? Jean? I says, I can't, I don't know. I'm trying to find Jean. She goes, what do you mean, where, where's Jean? I said, I don't know. I have to go find Jean. She goes, is she dead? She's dead. She's dead. I said, no, no. I, I, said, I hang up. So then I hang up the phone rings again. I said, ah. I pick it up. It's my dad. My dad, he's on the phone. He's crying. He says to me, he says, uh, he says, I know where Jean is. I said, you, where? He says, uh, she's over in the Chinatown firehouse. I says, what? He says, you, China? He says, you know where it is? Said, of course. Because I always told her, if you get any trouble in the city, go to the firehouse yeah. or put a firebox, you know? And so Jean wow. made her way to Chinatown. I ran, you know, wow. the, guy, the guy snapped that picture, and I didn't realize it. I said I was in prayer. And if I heard the, like the second, third click, I just told him, I said, I said, do me a favor, pal. It's not the right time. You know, can you move on? And it was, it was nice. And so that picture shot all over Associated Press and went out through everywhere, when, you know, through Europe and posters and things like that, that I found out. But um, it's so an incredible picture, man. It really I, is. I, so I, I whipped around and um, that, yeah, um, so I whipped around. I parked the truck, went to the Chinatown Firehouse. And uh, Jean was back there, you know, and she was all covered. And she thought I was in Staten Island, you know, taking this, the course. She goes, you know, where were you? Oh, that's going? right. That's right. I said, you could have you easily, uh, you know, you, you had a couple lucky spots there where you saw people and you didn't walk a little bit further. You would have been right under there, too, man. Yeah. Turn, turn, like I said. And, um, you know. It wasn't your time, brother. That's, it, bro. that's the only way you can figure it out. We've been doing this uh, for 20 yeah. years, right, trying to figure out how we're here. And some people Every time, aren't. Any, any one of our fatalities, you could say, oh, you know, it was just by the grace of God. That it could have been either one of us. How many times we say, wow, that was a close one. Well, that could have been a close yeah, one. Yeah, it's all lucky. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, that's yeah. a good story, uh, Dan. That's, that's a good providence story. too that you found your wife and then you ask God for guidance, man. That's really yeah. heavy, dude. Yeah. really I'm heavy. Big believer but, prayer. I'm, I'm a big believer prayer. Yeah. Now, tell me some of. I know that we had discussed uh, on the phone when we were talking some of the jobs. Obviously, the one. Uh, 
with uh, Tommy Williams, uh, that comes to mind. Obviously, guys would probably want to hear that. I want to hear that because I didn't. Yeah, get, uh, it was uh, interesting. Uh, it was on Grand Avenue. It was a, uh, uh, I think, about four stories high. The first story was a furniture store. Above it were these showcase windows, which were about six to seven feet high with a sill. So remember the sill part. So we got the alarm. We're going up there. Now, Rob Weedman, who was in Rescue 2. Right. Who got burned? Yeah, he was a, he was a buff that night. Is that right? Yes, I didn't know that. Yeah, he was a buff that night. So on the way up there, a couple of us are going, and I'm not going to mention the company's name, but we said, you know what? Watch out for this truck company. Okay, put that in the back of your skull, just like anybody else going on to a job. You know your companies. You know what you got when you get there, and you you, you act accordingly. So we get there and it was roaring pretty good, mostly smoke at the time, a little of fire on the roof. So uh, I was always Tommy's irons guy. So we're going up the stairs and I said, listen, uh, Tom, I see smoke coming up through the treads. Yeah, I see it too, Mike. Okay, let's get going. I said, no problem. We get upstairs, we start doing a search. We ended up in a vacant, uh, I guess a show showcase area where they must have shown stuff, but it had, uh, walls coming out with bookcases uh, horizontally to the wall. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, vertically, however you want. So I got you. I know what you mean. Yeah. And we were doing this, and it was getting progressively higher and darker. And uh, I, I don't get scared. Uh, but when it finally came to a point where Tommy and I separated, said, you go find that window. And I couldn't see the window. And after the fact, when they showed me the safety photos, you could see me viciously winging my halligan against the wall, which was a heavy-duty uh, uh, blaster, until I found the window. And I broke the window, and a rush of air came in because the wind was blowing from the south into the building. So it, it, I don't think it really helped out a lot. I think it might have made it worse. Mm -hmm. I don't know what really happened. All I remember is Tommy was not near me, and he gave a mayday. Mike? He said, Mike, find that window. We got to get the fuck out of here. So once he said the word fuck, I knew. Yeah, yeah, no I got you. Like, you know, there's a lot of curse words you use, but some of them. I got you. Yeah. Fuck from Tommy Williams was, I never heard it before. So uh, I found the window. I broke it. And all I remember is I gave a second May Day. I couldn't see really out the window. But I did remember telling Larry Hatton, the safety chief at the time. I, chief. I remember a, a shadow going by me. Now, I can't tell you that was Tom Williams, uh, but he was at the bottom. He had cracked his skull. Someone Phillips' skull cracked on the uh, curb. Uh, I finally let go like a cat on the sill. Fell, fell on my back, and then there you go. I, you know, I was doing my best to help out. I mean, you can tell by my face this was not something you ever think of. Dude, that's the real. That's a real deal. When you that's sent me that picture, I mean, that that's just. Uh, I didn't even you know, realize who that was. You know, I, I, Louis, you know what it is. Uh, I, I, I kept it because uh, it, it reminds me how lucky I was to become a city fireman. How lucky I was to work with the best, especially the gentleman that was dying there, Lieutenant Williams. Yeah, man. And the guys and uh, I had a. I was doing crazy things before I became a city fireman, but it was just like uh, 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 a good luck charm came in. I took the test. I got on the job, and these guys liked me. They looked for me for leadership. They looked for me for advice. They knew I was the go-to guy when it came to certain situations. So I keep this photo because I want everyone to know, and I hope everyone watching tonight, this this is not what you want to happen at, on any, not even your worst day. Yeah, and, and uh, that's a picture of terror. Uh, Mike. If you wouldn't mind, just can you describe what's going on in the photo for our audio listeners who may be listening to this tomorrow on the uh, on speaker or whatever? Yeah, that's me, as you can see, and then on the ground with his legs crossed is, is Tom Williams, and they had a paramedic eventually came to work on him, and these are the engine guy. I don't know who engine was working on, but at that time I had no clue what I was doing. Uh, yeah, I'm sure. Never, I'm sure. You know, I, I helped work on him. I helped. They intubated him. He had cracked his skull. And I know the paramedic told me, Mike, there's air coming out. This doesn't look good. 
Uh, and and you ju- I don't know if you said it. Did you say you jumped out out the window too? Did you say that? Yeah, I yeah, yeah. Yeah, I didn't hear you say. So that. what are you doing? You were hanging on to the sill, Mike. You went over. I hung on to the sill for a while. And yeah. Then finally, someone said, "Mike, let go. You got to let go." So I let go. I fell about maybe twenty feet. I don't want to exaggerate. And you didn't break a leg or an ankle no, or I, nothing. I, I, no, I was. Your adrenaline was probably through the roof, man. Yeah, I fell on my back of my Scott pack, took it off, and then I started that. You know, actually, when I landed, I fell this way, and I looked right in his face. Oh. <laughs> holy shit. Yeah, holy shit. So, right. You know, it's not what you want to do. I actually, uh, I looked up the, the, uh, the, the uh, fatality report from the FDNY for that, and, you know, they were just saying that it was all head trauma. He landed, you know, he went down head first. And, yep. uh, you know, they don't give a reason. You know, there's a couple things that they presume could have happened. Uh, they don't think he tripped out. They don't think of this, you know, similar to what you said, which was it was kind of a blur. And next thing you know, he was outside. Yeah. Um, but I, I think uh, I, what I wanted to say real quick, when I got to 117 in May of 93, my fr- when I was a probie, there was my lieutenant was Bill Urban, 108 guy, there a long time. Uh, and uh, he had a picture over his locker of Tommy Williams. And I didn't know who he was. You know, obviously, I didn't know who he was. I was a probie. And I remember him when he explained to me who that was, how much – passion you know think about that you know that you know how it is in the fire department we don't really oh, think yeah. about these things so the fact that he had his picture above his locker for years it was there you know the whole right. time i was there so right. uh, he obviously kept him in in high esteem you know what i mean so yeah. uh i was in with 216 and 108 uh and we got a lot of guys harry ford and a few others right. harry ford is another one right uh, uh, uh yeah so a lot of guys came from 216 and 108 to for before i even got there and then afterwards as well but you know it, it just was a tough day uh, I'll, I'll give you some other stuff that was was involved with that. When we got to uh, Elmhurst General, uh, believe it or not, the first line of duty death for Michael Judge was Tom Williams. Is that right? Yeah. 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 And uh, what time did that box come in, Mike? That was an early I, morning box. You, no, know, it was like nine thirty, ten o'clock at night. Okay. It wasn't that late. I think we just had finished dinner. Right. You know so. Uh, that's that's a, that's a close box for you guys, man, for rescue. It four. was pretty close. We got there pretty quick. You're right. Well, it's actually, Mike, it's 11 o'clock, 2304. Yeah. Okay. All right. Sorry for being off, but I, no, I, knew it was, I knew it wasn't late, early in the morning. Yeah, yeah. And that's actually a dead spot, believe it or not. I mean, the closest truck is probably 136 coming down Grand Avenue. So you right. guys are probably like second dude truck in there, man, at least. Yeah, you guys could be first dude there. Yeah. You could probably get yeah. there first dude. Oh, they'd have to pass for Going up the hill and make it a <clears throat> Or a ride. I don't know which. Uh, once you get to the expressway, and we're there. Yeah, Kev, that's right, right. That's right on the corner of the of the highway. It's right it's there. Yeah, on the right. Corner. You yeah. can see the bu- You can right. almost see the building from two eighty eight quarters, bro. Yeah. Right. Right. Yep. That's so, like part. I said, you know, I hope the uh, people that are watching, and not so much for the, but it, it doesn't matter if you're volunteer or, or paid. It, it, it's just that these things can happen, and uh, it's it's not anything you can prepare for mentally for a while because it's not normal and uh, there's no book on it and uh it doesn't matter how much time you have it doesn't matter no, it, it, it doesn't matter. it hurts it still hurts me today yeah i believe it you know it really does in uh 85 there was a helicopter went down on the east river as luck would have it i was the first guy geared up went in Pulled a man out of the the helicopter there. Uh, Dave Van uh, Dave Van Vorst in uh, Rescue Two. A couple other guys had made really dramatic. Uh, Yelpy. A couple of guys made really good uh, underwater grabs also. And all of a sudden, the scuba program was was taken off. It's like wow, this is working. And I got to give a shout out to oh, I can't remember his name. Um, it's a, a long Polish name, and I, I don't want to do it injustice. But there was a firefighter in. Chicago, and I think it was around 82, 83, that made a, a grab in the wintertime in a pond in a park. A kid was sleigh riding with his father. Uh, there was a news crew shooting B-roll for the weather. You know, they're out there and they're, they're shooting. his sleigh riding while the guy's going to tell you if it's going to snow or not, you know, for the news. And the father and the kid go into the drink. And wow. they both go underwater. And the father pops up, the kid's not there. And the news crew, in those days, there was the recording device, 
a long wire in between and the camera, not like today's stuff. So <clears throat> they made the smart decision of shutting the film off and they saved the man with the wire and they call the fire department and a guy with dive gear comes and goes in the water and between the, the, the delay of the alarm and by the time he finds him, it's about, it's got to say 35, 40 minutes and the kid has a complete recovery. It's cold water, right? The cold cold water. That yeah. was the start in my book. <clears throat> that was the start of rescue diving that it changed everything. It changed everybody's idea of what rescue diving could do. And that had such an impact on me and the firefighters in New York that were divers to realize that if the water was cold enough, and especially if the younger the person, the longer they had, you weren't just doing a recovery. You could actually save somebody. So, so now it comes, um, it's in uh, September of 1986. And we're on uh, 38th Street, still waiting for our new firehouse to open up. And uh, Jack Theobald, who I mentioned before, was one of my favorite guys to work with. Uh, Jack and I were in the tool room, and we used to listen to Soupy Sales on uh, NBC. And he used to have a TV show when I was a kid. Like People like Frank Sinatra would come and get hit in the face with a pie and all this kind of stuff. But he was a funny guy. He ended up being a disc jockey uh, or a talk show comedian on NBC and Jane Dornacker would do the traffic updates. So they were all friends because they all worked together. And that particular day we weren't listening. Uh, and we religiously listened to that show. And apparently what happened, they put the wrong part in the helicopter or something like that, but there was a technical problem and the helicopter uh, lost power. The pilot was able, which is amazing what, helicopter pilots can do because once you lose power it's you're basically flying a rock you know, it's not it's not like a plane <laughs> yeah it's you just know, straight down like, right yeah a plane you can glide, glide. With a helicopter you know he's trying his best she's yelling hit the water she didn't want to hit the land because they were right over the, the west side highway there 12th avenue and um he's able to lean the helicopter over and they go in the water right by the intrepid so People call up right away. We're on 38th Street. You yeah, know, you're right there, man. A couple of blocks away. So as soon as we pull up, uh, you know, there's a crowd of people pointing. A little piece of cyclone fence was down. And there's nothing. It's just nice, calm water. Uh, you know, nothing visible. You don't so, but people are pointing and yelling. And uh, I got my dive gear on. I'm getting ready to go. And uh, Jack Theobald's helping me get my stuff. Pete, and we John have that picture, right? Sorry, Paul. Uh, oh, yeah, do I do. Stand by. I do. She was, the, she was the traffic girl, right, Paul? Yes, they were doing live traffic on the air. Here it comes. And this guy. Oh, no, I'm sharing the screen. Oh, hello. <laughs> nice. Hold on. I got you. Stand by. <clears throat> All right, so I'll go back to it. But I'm standing on the, on the dock, and they come with a straight ladder, and they're trying to hold it in position. I'm still putting my belt on and everything getting ready because you have to take two seconds to make sure you're right because you can't, yeah, you can't change uh, what you're doing once you do it. So you have to be ready. <clears throat> so John Driscoll, uh, who's in that photograph right there, um, the side of his face is right next to the man. He's wearing the dark blue sweatshirt. Um, yeah. jo John can swim, but he's not what I would call a swimmer. He never became a diver. He's not like super comfortable in the water. He's the first guy in the water. He's one of the best firefighters I ever saw. Instincts like you couldn't believe. If if you were trapped, you want John coming. He's the first guy in the water. He goes out. I'm just getting ready to go down. There's another picture there, Pete, too. And I Sorry, see Paul. I see John out there, and somehow he found he found the rotor blade. This helicopter's on the bottom. Yeah, you see John just going down the ladder there. That's, that's me. him right there going down the ladder? Yeah. That's uh four truck, 54 engine, uh, 34 engine, and, <clears throat> and 21 truck. They all got there simultaneously, and they made this whole thing happen. You know, we, we came with the special tools, but if those guys, <clears throat> look what they're doing. Yeah, they got the they're, ladder there, the chain, yeah. the, the, the fence is cut. Yeah, they haven't, they're holding that ladder up so John can climb down. I mean, there's no ropes yet, even. This is all just happening, you know, second by second. 
So John goes out, he finds the rotor blade, and he's standing there, and he's going, Pauly, Pauly, come here, come here. So I swim to him. I follow his he's leg standing down. standing on the rotor blade? He found it, somehow found the tip of the rotor blade. Holy I, He must mackerel. have hit it with his foot or something. But That's incredible. So I go down. I find the, uh, the pilot, who's the gentleman that you see there in the first picture they're bringing back. The doors Did were closed. Did he make it? Because oh, he looked like he was dead. Did he make it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, amazing. Oh, he looked like he was a morta. He was, yeah, he was uh, blue. Yeah. He was about as blue as this shirt. <laughs> the door no, really. was closed, Paul? The door was Look closed. That. that is unbelievable. The guy really looks – I mean, he's ghost white. Yeah. yeah. When Oof. I got when I got to the door of the helicopter, now it's that murky green-yellow color. Yeah. You know, yeah it's yeah. not like the tropics or whatever. No. But I could see a little bit, maybe two, three feet in front of me. But I was on the helicopter, so it wasn't a problem. I didn't have to find it. John's right, right, right. So I got down. I find the door. I open it up, and there's this guy, uh, Mr. Pate. He's the uh, the pilot. So I, I, I reach in. I cut his seatbelt. I pull him out, and I take him up. Now, the good thing about the Hudson River compared to the East River is the current is nowhere as strong. Uh, the East River is not really a river. It's an estuary. The Long Island Sound comes through. Goes right, all so the way down, all so the, time. the water is always moving. The East River, uh, the Hudson River is a river. Comes from upstate, comes all the way down, meanders down. It does get moving, but not like the East <clears> River. <throat> so anyway, I hand off Bill Pate, and they take him, and I go back down, and because I figured there's two people in there, we didn't we didn't know it was the helicopter from the news show. We just knew a helicopter was down, and I I went back in and I went over to the other seat. And there was nobody there. And it was like, you know, momentarily surprised. Like, where's the second person? And then I look up and there she is. She she didn't wear the seatbelt. She had wow. been in a crash previously a, in New Jersey and she almost drowned. So she decided from then on that the seatbelt almost killed her. So she's not going to wear a seatbelt. So it's not going to kill her. So in other words, don't get in a helicopter with her. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. Well, well, sadly, and and that lady was, uh, uh, she was she was in movies. Uh huh. Uh, she was in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. She played Nurse wow. Ratchet. If you remember back to that oh, movie, oh, that was Nurse Ratchet. That was Nurse Ratchet. Yeah. Oh, really? She, yeah. She so was, I that was that. That was the nasty, the, the nasty yeah. nurse, right? Yeah, she was nasty. Yeah. I didn't oh, know it all the time. I I found everything out later. But I'm assuming she passed away there. Yeah. I, I take her out, I bring her to the surface, I hand her off, and just like you see there, they, they, they bring them all in. I'm I'm just catching my breath for a couple seconds, and I go down, I do a secondary search. There's nothing else down. There's only two seats, so you're pretty sure that there's only two people, but somebody else could have jumped in, but there was nobody else down there. Um, so I came back up, I went to the surface, and they had somebody threw a tarp on the ground, and they had both of them on the tarp. And 54, 34, 21, and 4 truck were doing CPR. No ambulances there yet. We got there so fast. All the companies were there so quick. They are do it, it was like a, a clinic on CPR. And they're just going and going and going. And I got all this adrenaline in me now. And sure, I'm man. standing there, and I'm feeling bad because they're doing CPR. First off, that's not good when you're doing CPR on people. And, uh, and it's going on a while. And thinking, oh, well, you know, well, we tried. And then all of a sudden, the lieutenant from 54 yells, he's breathing. Oh, my God. And I almost fell over. So <clears throat> I, I just, I got so emotional. I'm standing there in a wet, remember those tube socks? <laughs> <laughs> I'm in that blue. If you go back to that picture, I, I guarantee you, I'm wearing those tube socks. Am I? I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. That's a weird scuba suit you got on there too, man. I don't even know but what the hell that thing. When is. you put this, when you put the fins on, it's not like going He's to the beach. It's those. <laughs> this. But anyway, I'm, I'm wearing a wetsuit. I'm soaking wet, wearing a wetsuit. With tube socks on. I'm pretty sure I have white tube socks on. <laughs> Up to <And> the knee. <laughs> I, when they said he's breathing, I just got so emotional, I started walking south. I just had to get away. And I guess I walked about a block or two. <laughs> I'm leaving little wet footprints behind me. <laughs> and I saw a payphone 
and they went over. And in those days, you didn't have cell phones, but I had a credit card number that I could make. A, I could dial my house. So I called my wife up, and I'm sobbing, and I'm, I'm you wow. know, put the news on, put the news on. You can't believe, like, holy, ma I'm going to be late. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I'm going to metal day. <laughs> well, that yeah, yeah, but that was all later. I mean, no, of course, of course. The fact course. that this man started breathing, so they take him to the hospital. He he comes back, and just like with the little boy, back to <clears throat> Chicago, mm -hmm. he comes back, and when he comes up, that little boy in Chicago, from what I understand, he was like an eraser slate. Remember those things you have when you're a kid and you pull it up. And it's blank yeah, again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That yep. little kid was blank again, but they ah. retrained him. What's your name? Right. How to walk? Everything. And that kid was fine. Yeah. This guy comes up. He doesn't know who he is, but he's talking. He's doing everything. His family's there. He's slowly getting it. His family's going crazy. I, I, that you know, they were climbing on us. They couldn't believe it that we saved them, and and I couldn't believe it that we saved them. And uh, they wanted to buy everything for us: new scuba equipment, you name it, you know, whatever. So. One day, uh, a car pulls up in front of the firehouse on 38th Street. Guy knocks on the wicket door, the little door in the big door. Yeah, 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 yeah. And he goes, uh, hey, is this the firehouse where they did that helicopter thing? And the guy goes, yeah. He says, hey, I got, <laughs> something. I got something for you. He takes out two cases of lobsters, live lobsters, yeah. Drops him in the firehouse. That's hey, awesome. See ya. Who's that from? Ah, it's an anonymous gift. <laughs> the family sent him. Two cases wow. of lobsters. Wow. Have you uh have you ever kept in touch with that guy? Did he ever reach out to you years after or anything? Uh well, for a couple of years, um, his family would send me Christmas cards. <laughs> I think of all the knickknacks and stuff I have in my office, uh my prized possessions are handwritten cards from his kids. Oh wow. Wow, that's great. Yeah, it was, that was it was really cool. And I understand I ran into somebody him uh that knows him, I guess about two years ago. And I think he stopped flying helicopters smartly, oh. and he became a lawyer. Oh, good for him. So, How old yeah, was, was he then, Paul? I would guess he was uh, relatively, I guess, my age in his late late 20s, early 30s. Like, you know, about that. Yeah, young man. Dude, that's yeah. a great grab, man. That's in I mean, that's incredible. Oh, it, it was, uh, again, just being in the right place and having the good training. You know, it's... Had to be yeah, but you had to have uh, you had to be the point man. You had to be working. Yeah, well, you, you got to be you, you got to be serious and you got to be ready to do it. That's I you say can't... it all the time. You could be in the right place at the right time, but you still have to execute, man. And that's you got to uh, do. You got you to execute, yeah. and you know sometimes it takes. That's that's big balls to do that. You know, that's really is.